Hey guys, today we're going to be talking a little bit more about the short discussion that you just worked on um, about which emotion is stronger, love or hate. We're going to consider this from the book's perspective, the party's perspective, and then from our main characters, Julia and Winston's perspective. You also probably through this all should think about what your own perspective is on this idea. At the end of this video, or maybe in a separate video, we'll also start talking about the similarities between the two emotions um, and how one might be used to get to the other one, to facilitate the other one. So you need your books for this. And you need a Google Doc open to take notes. Um, um, you could do it by hand as well. We, that has been working well for me. If I can read your handwriting, that works great. Um, okay, so first of all, let's go to page 148. This is the section of the book where they are talking about hate week. Um, they talk about like everything in the community being geared towards creating the most amount of hate. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxwork displays, film shows, tele telescreen programs, all had to be organized, stands had to be erected, effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Um, they, Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taking off the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pamphlets. So in some ways it seems obvious the way that hate unites this community. It's like everybody is working on this one project. And so obviously they are going to be united in their efforts towards this one project, right? But it doesn't seem obvious why it needs to be dedicated to hate here. Why can't it be dedicated to love? And you could see it going the other way, right? Instead of hating the brotherhood and the rebellion and all that stuff, why don't they dedicate a week to loving your government? It's like realistic because you get to see me take pauses to drink without me bothering to pause the video. Uh, I love wasting your time. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, you know, we have a love week in our country. We have a love day, I guess. It's the 4th of July where everything on that day is supposed to be devoted to your political allegiance to our country, how much we love our country, red, white, and blue, flags, and so on. But in Oceania, you have a day dedicated, a week dedicated to hatred of your enemies. So I want you to pause the video right now and in your notes, um, Write down, all right, I stumbled there. What I want you to do is make sure you're on page 148. And in your notes, I want you to write down why this community thinks hate is such an effective form of government control. Just using that first paragraph on 148, just write a couple sentences about that. Okay, now let's look at that second paragraph on page 148. It says, the new tune, which was to be the theme song of Hate Week, the hate song, it was called, so creative, had already been composed and was being endlessly plugged on the telescreens. It had a savage, barking rhythm, which could not exactly be called music, but resembled the beating of a drum, roared out by hundreds of voices to the tramp of marching feet. It was terrifying. The pearls had taken a fancy to it, and in the midnight streets, it competed with the still popular, it was only a hope hopeless fancy. So they have this song called the hate song that's being played constantly. It has that strong beat that you've been warned about. Uh, the beating of the drum roared out by hundreds of voices. Um, to It's like a marching of feet, right? If you have ever watched any of the Nazi propaganda videos, that's what this reminds me of, and I'm sure that's where George Orwell was coming from. There's one movie in particular called Triumph of the Will by Lenny Riefenstahl, where um, it's very, very effective in the way that it shows unity, and that unity is all geared towards hate, but it's that marching, it's that savage barking rhythm. It resembles the beating of a drum. So what it feels like to me is that the emotion of hate appeals to something primitive in us and that Orwell in this book is assuming that that hateful emotion is somehow more innate in us than love and community. Um, and this goes back to the Freud essay that we actually have not talked about in second period, so let me just give you a little bit of a breakdown. Freud in Civilization and His Discontents, he talks about how people inherently are aggressive. That's our number one emotion is aggression, to get what we want. So we're, we're selfish and we are going to do what we can to get what we want and that is 
aggression, right? Um, but he talks about how we've traded in that aggression so that we can be part of communities. And part of that is to feel safe and part of that is to find love matches um, so that we can procreate. Um, but also, I think there is something uh, inherently that we inherently need about like being with other people, right? And so we give up some of our aggression, or at least we repress, we sublimate some of our aggression in favor of having community. And I think Orwell would agree with that kind of um, level of what what makes up our human nature, right? So that underneath it all is this kind of aggressive impulse, but that love is something that we've put on top of that aggressive impulse to kind of temper it and push it down, right? And here, Oceana is trying to tap in to that feeling that is the most innate. And he has this story in here about chocolate that starts to prove his point. Um, the chocolate story, hang on, I'm going to pause this and find it. Okay, the chocolate story starts on page 162. It says, one day a chocolate ration was issued. And I want you actually to read through that chocolate story. It goes from 162 to the end of 163. And then I want you to, well, you'll have to pause the video to read this. Um, read through that chocolate story and then in your notes, tell me what does this tell us about human selfishness? What do you think the book believes about human nature? Now in that story, it feels like there is something um, innately selfish and egotistic about human nature, right? But Winston could be focusing more on himself there and how he reacted when he wanted more chocolate. You'll see how this, this story turns for him though on the next page. So on page 164, Julia says, I expect you were a beastly little swine in those days, she said indistinctly. All children are swine. I'm inclined to believe Julia and to agree with Julia. Children are swine. Children are um, are naturally self-centered. Uh, they have um, they have a very large sense of themselves, and they don't develop empathy for a little while. That's just that's just factual, right? Not that they're awful, but but they are. Uh, a little bit awful. They are swine. So then you move down here though and he says that yes but the real point of the story and then Julia falls asleep. <laughs> she's just like whatever. Not interested in your morals, right? But what he's thinking about is his mom and he says she had been an unusual woman, still less an intelligent one. And yet she had possessed a kind of nobility, a kind of purity, simply because the standards that she obeyed were private ones. Her feelings were her own and could not be altered from outside. It would not have occurred to her that an action which is ineffectual thereby becomes meaningless. If you loved someone, you loved him. And when you had nothing else to give, you still gave him love. When the last of her, the chocolate was gone, his mother had clasped the child in her arms. It was no use. It changed nothing. It did not produce more chocolate. It did not avert the child's death or her own, but it seemed natural to her to do it. Okay, you look there and he says, the point of the story is not my selfishness. The point of the story is my mother's selflessness right? He says that she had a kind of nobility and purity simply because the standards that she obeyed were private ones, which means that no matter what outcomes the outside world tells her um, will be the consequences of her actions, she's going to obey a certain set of standards because she knows that they are true to her. And for her, that emotion is love. If you loved someone, you loved him. And when you had nothing else to give, you still gave him love. And what Winston is saying here is that um, it's ineffectual. Love is ineffectual. Holding a child in your arms, maybe it gives some comfort, but it does not give chocolate, which is the thing that they want, the thing that's going to keep them from starving. Love will not produce that, but she does it anyway. And that's the important part. She said, he says, that the terrible thing that the party had done was to persuade you that mere impulses, mere feelings were of no account, while at the same time robbing you of all power over the material world. So it's saying, what he's saying here is that the party makes it seem like you do things in order to get the consequences. And yet, it has taken away your ability to exert any kind of control over consequences. So you 
you uh, you feel like if you work hard, you're going to make a bunch of money, right? That's kind of like an American dream. Work hard. The harder you work, the more successful you will, you will be. And yet here in Oceania, they've taken away the, the ability to determine any part of those consequences by saying, no, the more you work, um, the there is no sort of correlation between that and the consequences. And yet at the same time, it is to it has told its people that emotions are mere impulses, mere feelings. And the important word there is mere, they're of no account, meaning that it is, there are, there is no reason to express an emotion or feel an emotion if there are no consequences to it. And this, this doing things, even when there are no material consequences is where Winston associates the hope of rebellion in this novel. If you go a little further, this is on 165 in the middle of that same big long paragraph, he says, what mattered were individual relationships and a completely helpless gesture, an embrace, a tear, a word spoken to a dying man could have value in itself. Um, and he thinks the proles that suddenly occurred to him had remained in this condition. We actually do see that. We'll, we'll be talking about this a little bit later, but we see that in the woman who is hanging laundry and singing a song. Singing that song has no purpose. It is just an expression of her feelings in the moment. Same with the bird in the forest when Winston and Julie are going to have their meetup in the, in the meadow. They hear a bird and he's like, I wonder why that bird is singing. And he can't imagine why something would just be expressing emotions for the sake of expressing emotions. And yet here he is after falling in love with Julia, um, if we do think this is love, after falling in love with Julia, he's starting to think through that question a little bit more and saying, the reason that my mom is noble is because she did things even though she knew they were pointless, even though she knew that there was going to be no benefit to herself or her children. And he says, the proles do this. He says, the proles had stayed human. And then he's speaking out loud and he says, the proles are human beings. He said aloud, we are not human. Why not, said Julia, who had woken up again. He thought for a little while. Has it ever occurred to you, he said, that the best thing for us to do would be simply to walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? And Julia says, yes, dear, it has occurred to me several times, but I'm not going to do it all the same. So, um... Here are our two emotions. There is the hate that Oceana is using, and then there is the love that Winston and Julia are discovering. And yet, it is not as simple as hate hate bad, love good, hate controlling, love freeing. Um, that's the way that they're thinking about it at this point in the story. But then you go to page 172, and this is when the two, the couple, are talking to O'Brien about their rebellion. And he goes through this list of things um, that he wonders if they would be willing to do. Are you, are you prepared to commit murder? Yes. Are you prepared to betray your country to foreign powers? Yes. Are you prepared to throw sulfuric acid in a child's face. Yes, no question. And then it says, are you prepared, this is on 173, are you prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? No, broke in Julia. And Winston has to think about it. It appeared to Winston that a long time passed before he answered. For a moment, he seemed even to have been deprived of the power of speech. His tongue worked soundlessly, forming the opening syllables of first one, of one word and then of the other over and over again. Until he had said it, he did not know which word he was going to say. No, he said finally. So we saw the ways that Oceana is using hate uh, for their control. Winston is thinking about love in terms of how to rebel. And here is the rebellion, as represented by O'Brien, thinking about how to use both hatred and love, and how you might be able to tap in to either hatred or love to create stronger emotions? How do you tap into hatred to create a kind of love for the rebellion? How do you tap into love to create a kind of hatred for Oceana? So I'm about to end this video, but what I want you to do is in your notes, I want you to write about this scene on page 172, 173, and make some um, observations about how emotions are being either celebrated or criticized.
by the book in this section. Uh, do we feel positively about emotions the way Winston does, like a positive, like you know, um, emotions without consequences, or are we starting to feel like maybe reason and the coldness of reason is something to celebrate in some ways?